Good morning, everyone. It's really great to be with you today. Uh, my name's Sarah. Um, I'm a licensed lay minister here at St. John's. Uh, shall we pray before I begin? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to gather together virtually um, to be in your presence. And I thank you that you are here with us. And I just ask that you would take these words that I've prepared and speak through them, um, that you would lift up and encourage your people um, through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Imagine with me, if you will, a young girl, maybe 12 or 13 years old, an orphan. Her parents died when she was young and she's being raised by an older cousin whom she loves and respects. She's an ethnic minority, an immigrant. The faith that she's being raised in is often mocked and discriminated against in the society that she lives in, so much so that she even changes her name. And then out of nowhere, she is taken away by soldiers, taken from the only family member that she has and the only home that she has ever known. And for what purpose? for the sexual pleasure of a power-hungry, arrogant, and self-indulgent king. And this is how the story of Esther begins. Thankfully, it's not how it ends. It's a story of power and of providence. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Esther in full, but at first glance, she's often described by commentators as some kind of biblical Disney princess. She's young and pretty. She lives in a palace. She wears beautiful clothes. And she is, I'm sure, blessed with a very good singing voice. Her story is often told as a love story where the king falls head over heels in love with her and picks her out out of a crowd of thousands of young women taking part in a beauty contest to be his queen. And she then goes on to save the Jews from destruction in a heroic act of bravery, and everyone lives happily ever after. But, but when you read the text, in a bit more detail, it has some much darker undertones, which we shouldn't gloss over. Despite the circumstances that Esther found herself in, she did most definitely save the Jewish people from a genocide. And there is a lot that we can learn from Esther's life that might help us to live out our faith today in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Esther shows us how we can stand firm in our faith, trusting in God's providence, even in desperate circumstances that might cause us to give in to fear. Her story shows us how to stand firm and have courage when everything going on around us is threatening to overwhelm us. And it shows us that even when God seems hidden, we know that he is always active and at work, even when we can't see it explicitly. I actually got quite angry when I was preparing for this sermon. <clears throat> Graham was asking me what I was planning to talk about. And all I could think of was the patriarchy and the oppression and exploitation of women and the racial injustice and the abuse of power. I could go on for hours, but I won't. But I've got two interesting facts for you. Did you know that Esther is one of only two books in the Bible named after women, the other one being Ruth? And did you also know that God isn't even mentioned in this book of the Bible, not once? And I think both of these facts are of significance. The rabbi and author Rachel Barenblatt describes Esther like this. I see her as an ordinary person who, under extraordinary circumstances, rises to the occasion of living out her best self. And when she does that, she becomes God's hands and voice in the world. I don't know about you, but one of my desires is certainly to be God's hands and voice in the world today. So we're going to look at the different ways we can see God's hand, or another word for this is providence, in this story, even without God's name being spoken. How can we find God's presence 
when God seems to be absent. So a bit of background. Esther's story, as we heard, is set in a place called Susa, which is in modern day Iran. It was the center of the Persian Empire, which stretched all the way from India to a place called Kush, which was uh, modern day North, Northern Ethiopia, Southern Sudan. And at the head of this Persian Empire, there was King Xerxes. And from everything I've read about this historical king, he did not seem to be a very nice man. He was obsessed with accumulating power as his vast empire grew. He was arrogant, he had a violent temper, he was self-indulgent, and he enjoyed flaunting his wealth and his possessions in order to be admired and even worshipped. And at this time, the Jewish people were in exile. They'd been scattered across the empire. They were separated from their beloved Jerusalem and their temple. And generations later, they were trying to figure out how to still be Jewish when practicing their faith in this culture often involved compromise. They may have felt alienated from God as they lived in a land where they were still treated as immigrants, a land that was rife with racism and hostility towards them because they were Jewish. And we first meet Esther after we find out that King Xerxes is on the lookout for a new queen. His previous wife, Queen Vashti, had been banished and most probably executed for disobeying him. She refused to be objectified by him and dance before him and his drunken friends. And I actually think she's a much overlooked female biblical hero. Without Vashti taking a stand against Xerxes, there would have been no Queen Esther. And we find out that Esther is an orphan um, and she's being raised by her older cousin, Mordecai. And we find out that they are Jewish of the tribe of Benjamin. And we also find out that Esther is in fact not even her real name. Her real name is Hadassah, a Hebrew name. But Mordecai clearly thinks it wise to change it to something a bit more Persian, maybe a bit more acceptable in society. He must have felt that it would be safer to keep their Jewish faith hidden, perhaps to avoid racist hostility. And we also find out that Esther is beautiful. And I wonder why this is relevant. Well, King Xerxes is looking for a new queen. And he had ordered by this royal edict that hundreds of virgins from across the empire were to be brought to the palace to join the harem. It tells us Esther is taken. This is no beauty pageant which she entered voluntarily. This is no love story. Esther was possibly only 12 or 13 years old at the time that she was taken. And yes, a harem is exactly what you think it is. These women, or should I say young girls, were basically being trafficked for sex. And it may have looked privileged and glamorous on the outside as they got to live in this royal palace and receive all these beauty treatments. Potentially a life of luxury compared to the obscurity some of these girls had been taken from. But at what cost? They were forced to complete these 12 months of beauty treatments before they were taken for their night with the king. And please don't think that they went on a nice date where they could get to know each other. These young girls had one night with the king and how they performed in bed and whether or not the king was attracted to them, whether they pleased them or whether he was pleasured by them would determine their future. How must have these young girls felt? How did Esther feel? Well, we don't know, because it's not mentioned at all. Because how women felt in the Persian Empire didn't matter. Women at this time were the property of men. They had no rights, they had no choices. They would generally go from being the property of their father to being the property of their husband, who would most likely have been chosen for them at a young age. Unless, of course, the king was on the prowl for a new queen. The Jewish biblical scholar Michael Fox writes, 
What is significant and most oppressive is that their will, whatever it might have been, is of no interest to anyone in the story. They are handed from home to harem to the king's bed. Their bodies belong to others, so much so that they are not even pictured as being forced. And it's into this situation, into these circumstances, that Esther becomes queen. This is no Disney fairy tale. And yet by the end of the story, she becomes the hero. She becomes the one with a book of the Bible named after her, a woman um, who the Jewish festival of Purim uh, celebrates. Um, it celebrates her act of bravery in saving the Jewish people from destruction. How did she do it? How could someone living in such desperate circumstances still be God's hands and voice in the world? And just in case you don't know the rest of the story, here's a brief summary of what happens next in the words of Jewish Christian academic Lauren Winner. So there's this guy in the king's cabinet named Haman, and he's very puffed up and full of himself. He gets the king to issue an edict that everyone must bow down before him, Haman, whenever he passes in the streets. One day he walks by Esther's cousin Mordecai, and Mordecai refuses to bow down before him because it would be a flagrant act of idolatry. He's Jewish. Haman is ticked off and embarrassed. In fact, Haman has never really liked the Jews, and he's sort of looking for an excuse to get rid of them. Mordecai's refusal to bow down before him is as good an excuse as any. So Haman goes to the king and says, there's this group of people living among us who don't obey your rules. Their ways, they're not our ways. It's going to be a bit of a problem for our empire. So give me the authority, and I'll have them taken care of. I'll have them all killed. So the king assents. He says, go on, go take care of it. You sort of get the impression reading the book that the king's not really paying that much attention. He doesn't seem to be the wisest, most thoughtful royal governor that we can imagine. He's somewhat arbitrary. Anyway, through her cousin Mordecai, Esther gets wind of Haman's plan to destroy the Jews. And she heroically sums up all her courage and petitions the king to save her people, even though she knows that he could decide on a whim to kill her. And the king stays Haman's hand and indeed winds up hanging Haman on the very gallows that Haman built for Mordecai. The Jewish people are saved. The end. And the book of Esther is the background to one of the main Jewish festivals uh, called Purim. Purim is celebrated around February or March, and it's the most fun of Jewish festivals, which you might think is a little odd considering the story. But it's a celebration of the Jewish people being saved. And um, for, for Purim, children and families, they dress up in fancy dress. It's a bit like a mashup of Halloween and Mardi Gras. And they have parties, and there's food, and there's lots of drinking, and great merriment. And the story of Esther from the scriptures is read aloud in the synagogue. And the congregation are encouraged to boo and hiss and, and as loud as they can for Haman in order to drown out his name. And they're encouraged to cheer wildly for Esther and Mordecai. It's a bit like a raucous panto with evil villains, hapless kings and young heroes. It's, dr it's a dramatic and exaggerated tale but the Jewish people are saved from destruction. And even though it happened several thousand years ago, it's still being celebrated today. So what is it that we can learn from Esther's story? So much of this story seems to me to be about power and how that power is used. As a community organizer, I love talking about power because we know that if you have the right kind of power, you have the ability to act and bring about positive change for your community. But we also know that power can be abused, corrupted, and used to dominate. And we see Esther begin with no power. She was powerless 
She's both a woman and she's a Jew from an immigrant family. And yet somehow she ends up as the queen with the power to stop her people from being annihilated when she steps out in faith. How? I think it's because this story is also about providence, about God's hand working behind the scenes to bring about his purposes. <clears throat> in the dictionary, providence is described as being God or a force that some people believe controls our lives and the things that happen to us, usually in a way that protects us. It's also uh, described as the belief that all things are ordered and regulated by God towards his purpose. And yet, God is never mentioned in this story, not once. And yet we see his providence in every detail. So how do we stand firm in our faith and trust in God's providence when everything around us tells us that God has abandoned us? We can't see God working. We just feel desperate and overwhelmed by our circumstances. It would have been easy for Esther to give in to misery and bitterness, but I don't think she did. Because somehow, the passage that we heard tells us that she found favor with everyone. She found favor with Hegai, the eunuch, who was in charge of the harem. And then she found favor it says, with everyone who saw her. And eventually, she found favor with the king more than once. And I wonder how she did this. Perhaps Esther is more than just a pretty face. This suggests to me that she had depth of character in order to gain this favor from those around her. She was still powerless at the time. She was being controlled in this harem, being prepared for her night with the king. But when you are powerless, perhaps the only choice you have is how you respond. And it doesn't tell us specifically in the text how Esther won this favor. But I imagine it was because she chose to be kind, to be gracious, to be compassionate to those around her who were in the same situation as her, rather than responding with anger and bitterness. And if we believe that God is working behind the scenes providentially, perhaps this favor comes from him also, working through a life that is dedicated to him. Because when we dedicate our lives to God, he changes us. He makes us more like him. He transforms us so that we display the fruits of the Spirit. So that when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, we respond the way that God wants us to respond. You know, this year has been long and hard. It's caused us anxiety, uncertainty. It's caused us fear. It's made us feel overwhelmed and powerless. So how could we, like Esther, stand firm and have courage in the face of fear and uncertainty? How could we stand firm like Esther, trusting that God is still at work, even though we can't necessarily see it or feel it? We sang the song Waymaker earlier. And it says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. No matter how bad things get, we know that God will never stop working. He's relentless. He is committed to redeeming his world and overcoming evil with good. So even when we feel powerless, when we think about this virus, when we think about government restrictions, the economic depression, the climate crisis, etc., etc., we need to remember that God has not forgotten us and that, in fact, he is continuing to work. His presence is real. And so we can face the world around us because we can respond the way God wants us to respond. In Romans 8, verse 28, the Apostle Paul reminds us that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, 
we have been called according to his purpose. God can and will bring good out of this situation, out of 2020. And it's up to us if we want to be a part of that. If we are willing, God will rise up the powerless to challenge the powerful. We see it in the life of Esther and even more so in the life of Jesus. And as we approach Advent, we also remember how Jesus came into this world as a helpless, powerless baby. And then for 30 years, nothing happened. The Romans were still occupying Israel. The Jewish people were still oppressed. They didn't even know that their savior was already here, waiting for the right moment to reveal himself to them so that he could not only save the Jewish people, but all people. How will we respond? <laughs> Interestingly enough, I've not even touched on the most famous line in the book of Esther, when Mordecai says to her that perhaps God has put her in this place of power for such a time as this. I've not even got to the part of the story where Esther fasts and prays before risking her life in order to save her people. Interestingly, the king's edict to kill the Jewish people, it couldn't be revoked. Instead, the king had to issue a new edict, giving the Jews the power and authority to, to protect and defend themselves against their enemies. God doesn't always take away our problems or remove the difficult situation from our lives, but instead he gives us what we need to get through them, to overcome them. The Bible Project um, <clears throat> has a great video um, about Esther, and it also says this on their website. When I read this story, I see a young girl who stands up with courage and turns the worst possible thing into the best possible thing, who doesn't lose heart even though she went through one of the worst life experiences ever. I see a girl that stands up and fights for those who cannot fight for themselves, literally. I'm confident that God has put each of us exactly where we are for such a time as this. We might feel powerless at the moment, but he has given each of us power. Perhaps to some of us, positional power, influence, but certainly to all of us, relational power. We all have power and influence over those around us in our lives, our family, our friends, our interactions on social media, how we respond as God's people to this crisis, to these difficult circumstances, will have an impact on others. Can we be like Esther and respond with kindness, with grace, and compassion in everything we do and say. It's tough, and I'm not saying that we won't have difficult days, and we will get it wrong sometimes, I know I do. But if we really believe that God's providence is at work, behind the scenes, bringing about good from even the worst of circumstances, then what do we have to fear together? Let's choose to be God's hands and voice in this world. Shall we pray? If you'd like to stand where you are, you can do that. You might want to open your hands as a gesture um, to receive from the Holy Spirit. Father God, I thank you for the power and influence that you've given each of us. And I also thank you for your providence that you have promised to work for good in every situation that we face. Lord, help us to trust you. No matter what the world around us throws at us, help us to respond graciously and lovingly to those we interact with day to day, especially when we feel overwhelmed and anxious and powerless. Lord, we ask you for your forgiveness when we failed in this or gotten it wrong or responded in anger or bitterness. Show us, Lord, when we need 
to use our power for the sake of those who have none and when we need to speak out in order to bring about justice. Would you help us stand firm in our faith and have courage just like Esther did? We thank you that you love each one of us. Holy Spirit, come and use us for your glory in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.